So thank you so much for joining me. I know that I uh, asked you about this quite a long time ago and between our schedules, we've been going back and forth. So I am truly excited that after all these months, we actually can have this conversation. You are already getting all these hearts and hellos <laughs> on Facebook. So I let people know that you don't have access right now to the comments and I'm gonna be breaking in periodically with questions and everybody's good with everything. So um, I just want to thank you again both so much. And as I always do, I like to turn the introductions over to the people I'm interviewing. I actually find that not only um, do they do a better job than I do, but it often leads to the first or second question of the interview. And as anybody who has seen my interviews know before, these are completely spontaneous. We have no idea what we're going to talk about, or where we're going to head, and that just makes it so much more interesting. Good. Okay. Um, do you want to go no, first? No, or no. You, should, should you want someone to go first? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. My name is Nick Bantock. Um, I'm an artist, a writer. I've been doing what I've been doing, well, certainly the art part, since I was 15 years old. Um, I've been, uh, I guess you'd call it a professional. I didn't start writing until I was 40. And then I was extremely lucky with one of my first book ideas, um, it was Griffin and Sabine. And not only did it make the um, top of the bestseller lists in uh, USA and many part of the world, but it, um, it, was, um, it was the launching for me of being able to marry words and images in a way that um, I didn't even know, and probably a lot of other people didn't know was possible. That's, that's basically who I, there's all sorts of other bits and pieces like soccer player and psychotherapy and all the other stuff that we'll all <laughs> tumble over and stumble bum through, I'm sure. But that's, that's the starting point. And this is my wonderful wife. And I'm Joyce Bantock and my background is in commercial textile design. I went to art college in England and did that. Um, and that's back in the day when textile designs were all hand painted with gouache on flat paper. And uh, then the computers came in and sort of took over and I didn't have any interest in trying to switch over to learning to do the designing on the computer and don't have a great love for computers. So I sort of had to reinvent myself and that's when I started to work with collage and play around and um, took a long time, I would say, till I really found my voice and what it is that I really like to work with. So I- Well, I think you, you had a resistance to calling yourself uh, an artist or fine a, artist, yes. a fine artist. The commercial so, training. I yeah. sort of was a bit of a, a leap, um, but with a little bit of help. <laughs> Just yeah. a bit of encouragement. <laughs> a good and, team. And you're comfortable with that title now? Very much so now. Now that I know the materials that I like to work with, with the old documents, the old letters, and the old fibers and things, that's I finally, probably 11 years ago, really feel I found my footing with. Uh, I actually know quite a number of graphic designers who only worked commercially and maybe did art privately, never really sharing it. And when they made the transition, uh, as a lot of them have, have and have tried, really they often struggle with their identity in terms of am I a true artist is this about business how do how do I make that shift so interesting yeah. to hear that you've had that experience as well yeah the computer is a great tool to work with but it's not something that I just wanted to solely work on doing the designs it didn't work for me so I gave it a bit of a shot and I bowed out gracefully I, I think through the physicality actually being able to work with something tactile and tangible yeah, and, the, the and the hand-eye coordination and all of those are extremely important uh, not just for us but I think for, for many people to bring them back into um, the, the real world for want of a better term. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting somebody left a comment that says I only read in quotes real books never ebooks so <laughs> You know that 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 split is as much as we live in a computer-based world. I think there's so many of us. I don't necessarily know if it's more creative 
people or more artists, but who still value and love the, the physicality of, of turning a page and touching a book and, you know, doing it uh, in a more real way. I think that cuts across a lot of the people who are who are watching. Right. And, and there are the peripheral senses as well. Things like the sort of smell of a page as you turn it, the touch on your fingers, the relationship that you have with it, it is, is very different. I, I think the, the other huge thing is the risk factor. With a computer, you can always go back two or three layers. Mm. <laughs> well, when you're painting and drawing, yes, you can use an eraser or paint over the top of something. It's very, very different. So when, you're, when you learn to ride the risk and the happy accidents that occur and use those as part of your work, then you start to trust your, not just your own process, but the way in which you connect with other people. Oh, I agree with that 100%. I think uh, the more you're able to do that and the more trusting you become of that and the risk taking you, 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 you become, the more you explore your sort of capacity as an artist and your work just always gets better and better. Yeah. I don't know if, you, if either or both of you find that sometimes when you do put a layer down or make what you know, might be labeled by somebody else a mistake, that, that, that problem solving that comes with that often leads to a, so much of a better piece than would have absolutely existed before. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I, so often I'm moving along a certain track thinking I'm in control and then it starts to die. <laughs> so then what I have to do is create some chaos and to the, the point where, I, when I used to teach workshop, I, I use the expression order chaos, order chaos, that that's actually how you, you force, you, you lay down chaos, then you work into it, and then you choose the bit that you like best, and then you make some more chaos, and slowly you try and get the piece to a point where it's telling you what it needs. So the further you go on, it's more about looking and sort of listening and then responding to what the picture is asking for. Much more yeah. When we spoke the other day, I said this to you, I said, I think we were separated at birth because there are, there are literally words that come out of your mouth that <laughs> I have said so many times. And it's probably true with, with many, many artists, but Pete, you know, this, this idea of embracing chaos, it's, yeah. it's, it's an, a brilliant approach. And I know that a lot of people have a hard time with that. So I don't know, you know, this is not a master class, but if you even have either or both of you have a suggestion about when somebody gets afraid of the chaos in their work, how can they learn to embrace it or accept it? I, th I think there's a lot of different ways. Got Sometimes different... if I find something's going a bit sideways, I like to just put it aside mm. and then work on something else and then revisit it later on. And then you look at it, I look at it quite differently. And then I, sometimes I know exactly what it needs hmm. or I've created other things that I can place on top. And then that just kind of falls together. Like yeah, you can go at it with your own hand, for example. Don't force that. Yeah, you know, with your non-natural hand, just, just for five minutes, start making some marks on the piece and do it physically and energetically rather than in a controlled way. I think, so many of us are taught at school that you can, the idea is that you conceive something and then you try and execute mm -hmm. it. And that's very much part of Western thinking. You're always moving towards the goal. But if, you, if the process is more about releasing what's there, Michelangelo made that famous remark about releasing the figure from the stone. It's if, if you, instead of trying imposing on your picture, you actually accept your skill level, whatever it is at any given time, and then just see what you can pull out of it. You know, the, it's like you're letting it come up through you and just come onto the page. Yes, you can, if you can just hand it over. There's yeah. somebody who um, is in my group I connected with recently who told me that she had had an accident and broke uh, multiple bones in her dominant hand and was so frustrated and so eager to still create that she decided she was going to make in her intention to move forward daily with her non-dominant hand. Yes. What she discovered quite quickly was that because she had no expectation that she actually could do well with it and it was chaotic to begin with, that it 
ended up being so much dramatically better than she ever expected so much quicker, more, more quickly. So I think, well, go ahead. I was going to say, to me, but what you're also introducing with that is your, the potential of bringing in your own internal dialogue. So the anima, animus, left side, right side of body and brain are often the ones that are in argument stroke dialogue. So if you allow both sides a way of speaking, one may be my right side tends to make marks that are you know, controlled, fairly sophisticated from many years. My left side can't do that, but my left side is far more emotional in its response. It's more physical. So once they both get a chance to say something, they balance each other out. Yeah, that integration is great. Rather mm -hmm. than trying to compartmentalize, I'm going to read a few comments. Um, they're all random because that's how comments are. Mm -hmm. um, I have many of, of of your books and get, been given and have given them as gifts. They're great. I love that book. I just read that book. It blew my mind. So beautiful. And then um, many people talked about books itself having. Um, Computers are a blessing and a curse at the same time. You are talking our language. Working with hands and feeling the materials is so different from using a computer. The tactile nature of the books is so magical, makes me part of the story. Um, Karen says, and I really like this, I like the sound of turning pages. Um, love the Nick Bantock books, have three, and I've also given many as gift. Love your artwork, your own, own several of your rubber stamps. I'm <laughs> so happy to meet you both. Several people brought that up uh, privately to me that they are hoping that I have some power or sway over you for some reason, that I can get you to reintroduce your stamps and your ink pads. I wish so, I could. The, the, that, that company is long gone. Sadly, the woman who ran that company is no longer with us. Um, that's, just, that's just part of the history. Th think of it in terms of the, the layers of a collage, you know, just because you can't actually see all the previous layers, it doesn't mean they're not there. So everything we do within our art, um, we learn a skill, we may not use it for another 10 years, but it's still informing other parts of what we do. I would definitely say that's, that's very, very true. Um, and you mentioned collage and Joyce, I'm, I'm curious, I always am fascinated by how people describe themselves. So like, do you, do you consider yourself a collage artist? Like or more mixed broad media, mixed media what ephemeral <laughs> artist is what i've sort of used that label but I, a collage artist yes but i add um dimension to my work which is a little a bit different from others and well, uh, show, show, show what you're holding <laughs> this is her, this is her rosary that you know. <laughs> well, no, it's just, it's when i go into the studio i don't go in with a preconceived idea which is completely contrary to the way that i was trained as well um so sometimes i don't really have a plan but i'll go in and i'll just make little objects i have a tray that i create little things that are either knitted and rusted wire and mm. rolled papers or you know sticks i don't know if you can see sticks like mm. this the little rolled papers love that sticks um a whole a number of things that i play with different materials, paper, clay, and things like that. And then I don't know why I'm making them, but they go on the tray. And then when I do get my old papers together and I move the objects in and out, usually I just find the one thing that sort of clicks and is perfect for that place. So sometimes it's just playing, really. Well, I love that, bringing, bringing that sense to it. It, it. You know, not only does it sort of bring joy to the art, but at least for me, that makes the art making so much more pleasurable. Yeah, um, I love I love the fact though that you um, go in with no notion, mm -hmm. similar to myself and so many so many of us. And then you're creating components, not necessarily for a particular project. And similar to what Nick kind of suggested, you're almost just listening to the pieces, and they're telling you where to go and what to do and where to place them and how they work together. Yeah, it's just what materials I feel like handling on that particular day, what feels right. It's, so, a, it's a feel that is really interesting, again, because of our culture has taught us to um, value logic um, you know, most of the time. 
So to some extent, particularly in a patriarchal society, there's this inclination to be nervous or scared of uh, a thought feeling, an instinct that is actually coming from the, uh, the, the point that Suzanne says is where you feel the golden mean. You can work out the golden mean mathematically, but that's not what we actually do when we say this is the right spot to place this. It's we actually go to that part of ourselves in here that is clued in to what feels right. And we know a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, and boom, you get that quiet little click, like dropping the final piece in a jigsaw puzzle. But that's not easy. That is something that takes time. It <laughs> takes that long. That was my big struggle. Right. And often I had to um, call in the expert to give me a hand <laughs> as to where it would um, look best. But in, in the end, I got there. <laughs> it builds. Yeah. It builds yeah. the skill yeah, level. Exactly. It, it's like anything else. It's it's with time and experience and practice. And um, right. yeah, sometimes the best way to become better at something is just to keep doing it. Good. Simple Good. as that. You know class is not necessary it's just literally just just the practice of it um i have a lot of questions there's been a couple of questions on here i have a couple of questions about you two kind of as a couple sure um but before i do that even going further um more basic there was a couple of questions about where are you and what's in that background and so can you <laughs> tell everybody like where you live and and all that and some well, of those we, we, victoria bc okay um, we're in our house, this we're, is our yeah. dining room. And okay. behind us is a very large, very large painting of mine that goes, well, it's a nine foot long. Okay. And it's like one wall. Yeah. <laughs> nine foot long, yeah, nine foot long and four foot high. So it's a triptych. Yeah. Um, and by rights, it should be way too big for the size of the dining room but it's Perfect. one of those things that actually reads like a window into um an alternative universe oh i love that i mean that's that phrase in and of itself is the perfect phrase for artwork a window into an alternative universe. we live in such a a, a difficult time for many people that i think magical realism is is an escape and then the, there's the kind of uh entertainment straight entertainment magical realism but then there's another kind of magical realism which is the one that leads you through to your subconscious and you know in Jungian terms onto the collective so if you can tap into that and you can be doing that on a day-to-day -day basis so that your art and your spirituality and your you know your life in general are all roughly on this in the same place they just feed off each other yeah there's some sense of harmony with that for sure you're getting a lot of response to your dining room appreciating <laughs> that and also to canada um, <laughs> um how how did you end up in victoria slash Canada, I'm curious. Let's go. Well, from where? I mean, well, you grew up. <laughs> I grew are you up. Can, Joyce, are you Canadian? I was born in Scotland. Okay. Um, but I moved to Canada when I was small, and then I returned and went to art college in England. Okay. Stayed there for eight years, and then so I'm a bit of a mixture. But we were on Bowen Island, Vancouver, Salt Spring Island, mm -hmm. and now Victoria, which we love. Yeah, it's yeah. it's 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 it's, it's great up offer. here. Yeah, did, um, did, my my background originally is um, I was born in the UK, lived there for the first you know half of my life, and then um, uh, when my ex-wife and I had a one-year-old son, we decided that we couldn't live in Thatcher's Britain because it wasn't big enough for both of us, and she wasn't leaving. So. <laughs> So we, we came to Canada and I, I mean, part of the reason for coming to Canada was back then England was one of those places where um, if you had an idea to do something, 10 people would tell you why you couldn't do it. Mm. Whereas my first experience of Canada was people just said, well, go for it. And I loved that combination of elbow room 
and go for it. I mean, there are things I miss, obviously, with Europe, with uh, history and buildings and um, not being close to my beloved Arsenal football team. But apart, <laughs> apart from that, um, yeah, I, I, I think we're in one of the best places in the world. Is it? But don't tell everyone. The secret is now out. I love Vancouver Island. I really do. Vancouver, uh, Canada and particularly BC have a very special place in my heart. You, you guys probably don't know my backstory, but mm -hmm. I would only be an art. I'm only an artist because of meeting an artist in Vancouver. Oh, interesting. Um, so in that period of time, that was in 2000, I spent many, many um, over the course of time, months in that area. Um, exploring the island and it, yeah it, so for me it's a very magical place and now that you two I mean you were probably there then too but now that I know you're there um, that makes it even more magical for me which is just great. So there's one thing I did whilst, whilst you're on this subject is, is um, uh, if anyone um, wants to see particularly Joyce's work um, mine is a little less accessible it's around but she has a studio here and I yeah, oh, I, I do. Too. But if she, if if they, uh, but I'm promoting you. On this <laughs> but if they're coming, if they happen to be coming to Victoria, contact us through Facebook. Yeah, and, we and welcome we're, studio we're, visits. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I just want to highlight that that they've offered for a private invitation. Yeah, to everybody yeah. listening and watching um, to visit them. Not not just showing up, but message them, which yeah, is fantastic. Not, not, not showing up and not coming for um, for drinks and dinner <laughs> and, then staying, and staying for a fortnight and yeah. putting their tent in the garden. No, no, this is <laughs> this is an encouragement to uh, come and see yeah. Joyce's work, which is um, particularly in the three dimensions, because it's no matter what you see, if you go to Instagram and see her work, it's what you different. don't get is that, um, Zen-like quality that you get when you step into her studio and see oh. the three-dimensional things that have an extraordinary way of just calming you down yeah. and, and feeding so, you at the same time. Yeah, Joyce, your work is is it's it's so stunning. It it just to me it it really resonates with me. I um, love the sort of I mean people will use different words. I'm just going to say muted color palette. There's lots of ways to describe that. Um, it seems so tactile to me. I love when collage artists bring in a, an element that's a little bit like an assemblage or assemblage, which I know you do. Um, there's just so much beauty in it. And we can actually show you to prove it. Oh my God. Yeah. Look at that. That is so tactile. Okay. That also appeals to, appeals to my love of symmetry. Yeah, so a, a lot of my pieces take a lot of time. There's, they're not things that I'm rushing along. For instance, this piece is a number of circles that I've cut from different colored washi paper and sculpted with polymer and then glued onto spheres. And I just happen to have this wonderful box that they fit neatly into. So yeah. Okay, so, so before you make that disappear, can you put it really close once more to so that everybody can now know what that is. Could is you say it one more time what that is? Can you see it properly? I'm They're like yes. paper barnacles. Yes. yes. I sorry. mean, I, I legitimately thought when I first saw that, that those were found on the beach. No, I've created those. So. Yeah, that's extraordinary. <laughs> sure, sure and this, one and, is well and this is another thing that I had created a, a section of these on the flat. And every time I went to lay them onto one of my pieces, it just never really worked. It was just too mm. heavy. And then when I realized that I could actually wrap them around something, give them dimension, that's when they really worked. So there's uh, these ones too. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, which one here? Slightly closer. Yeah, that one. Yeah, sure, that one's behind. Yeah, comments. Wow. Fantabulous. Spectacular. Uh, <laughs> Joyce, your work is the kind of collage I like. Very interesting. I'm so looking forward to exploring more of Joyce's work. The paper spheres are amazing, spectacular. Oh, that is gorgeous too. So 
a lot of these are these are the original old letters, old documents, and I think that's why a lot of my my color palette has this soft muted coloring is because that's what the papers are. They're just they feel wonderful as well. So I use the actual documents or letters, and I roll other old letters into circles, and these are little paper cones that have been added onto them as well. I'm not sure if you can see if the reflection might be. No, you're actually holding it perfectly right, right, perfectly right. well. Tilted back, the top tilted back a little bit. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, that's gorgeous. Um, it, it, it taps into what we were talking about before about using original materials and yeah. risk. Because if you just simply take a photocopy of an old document, it's it's no you're, you're not taking chances. But if you you pick up a, a letter that comes from Paris in 1840, yeah. and you're actually working directly with that, not only is it there is the the immediacy and chance, but it it makes you feel part of the time. Mm. So you are attaching to history. And so when the viewer observes it, they too become part of that history. Yeah, yeah I think that's a really important point. We had, we had spoken um, prior to this interview about using uh, originals and how many people find that challenging. And in fact, somebody just said, he definitely sounds exactly like Seth talking about materials. Um, because yeah, I've crossed over long ago into only originals and it's, there's a, there's a risk, there's a thrill, there's an excitement. There's something that uh, it's a built in history, as you say, and it, it makes a difference. It really does. Yes. Um, in, and some in people you, are really nervous of it, but, but I have a sort of, um, just tell yourself if it costs less than 10 bucks, I can do what I like with it. <laughs> That's a good motto. It should be on a t-shirt. <laughs> and I will remind people of that. Um, a few other comments. I'm just going to throw it in. The paper sculptures are amazing, wonderful, lovely. Um, I am breathless looking at them. Uh, so agree about using the originals to feel the texture. Your work makes me think of what to do with all documents. So your job is done. Um, and then a question that I was going to ask that some that um, someone else asked, Karen asked, do you ever collaborate with each other? We help yeah. each other. Yeah. We help <laughs> each other. We support each other. If I find things that I think Joyce can use, yeah. we try and keep a sort of like a, a relatively paper thin line between what we do. I think we could both easily sort of cross over, the, but we try not to, to just for sort of um, for clarity's sake. It was very important to me not to be seen to be doing anything that Nick does. I wanted to have my own voice. Right. That's why a number of things went in the bin over the years until I really. <laughs> until you developed what you felt was you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah and I think we're driven by slightly different things. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sort of much more metaphysical, I mentioned magical realism, but also my, my uh, color palette. Um, tends to differ depending what I'm working on. Joyce's color palette, as you've seen, right. sits Soft, in, right. in a place that is um, resonant to the atmosphere and the emotion that I see her trying to create. One, one of the things that I feel very strongly from both of you is a very, very, very clear and distinct artist's voice. A lot of people struggle for ever sometimes trying to find that voice and really sometimes come to it sometimes don't and it's so wonderful to be able to i think um go on say instagram scroll through and see the work and identify the person who's doing it before you've even seen the name and i definitely feel that really strongly with both of you and you know your work while i still think there's there's some overlapping connection there it's extremely different certainly at first glance yeah yeah good. yeah and and it should it it's good that it stays that way my stuff tends to be much more varied because over the years i've given myself permission to work in whatever direction i feel like on a given day because i'm 
I've never had to um, try and uh, brand myself, you know, and defend that position as many people do when they um, when they have a gallery, get say a gallery representing them, right. and then there's that pressure to just keep is, producing yeah, variations same. of a theme. Yes. I've always adhered to the Robert Rauschenberg approach that you you wake up, you go into the studio and whatever excites you, wherever your adrenaline is is going or your your curiosity or your intellectual preoccupation. Yeah. yeah. You just yeah. you just you run with it and see where it takes you. Yeah. And, and don't be frightened. I think that's a struggle for a lot of artists that that issue because there often is pressure sometimes directly if you're represented by a gallery, but even by the people who follow you yeah. to, they know you for something and that's what they want to see. And you have to kind of, and a, a lot of people are driven these days by social media. And so, you know, you put something up extremely different and you get a lot um, of, you know, quiet, fewer yeah. likes, you know, for some people that is, that becomes a struggle. You know, and maybe they don't have the confidence to say, "I'm just going to do what I'm going to do," because I'm trying to build my my art practice, and I need the I need people, I need followers. And yeah, I'll give you a practical example. When I when I first left art college, um, I after a couple of years, I started doing book covers, and of a um, commercial book covers, yeah, commercial book yeah. covers, paperback, hardback for many of the big publishers in the UK. And I was told really early on, you have to specialize. You have to pick a genre. You have to do um, detective, sci-fi hardware, sci-fi, you know, sci-fi fantasy, you know, romance. You have to do that because otherwise you won't get work. And I was really stubborn. And I, I would just kept on showing portfolios with lots of different things in. And I was, wouldn't take certain jobs on because they were repeat, but I would try and do something different. Then there was suddenly a crack and a change after about four or five years where I got known as the person that did the difficult stuff. So when the publishing house would say the art director would get uh, 80 books for the month, they'd go through and they'd hand off the first 75 and the five that were left were by far away <laughs> the most interesting things. Right. And they say, who the hell's doing Oh, we'll give it to Nick. <laughs> Because we don't want to read the book. He'll read it and then he'll come up with something that somehow sums up the book. But it also gave me this enormous freedom to create lots of different types of art, use lots of different materials, throw different things at each other in the same way that Turner would put watercolour on top of oil painting, which is ridiculous, mm -hmm. but he made it work and that's how his sunsets developed. So the more elbow room you give yourself, the broader your abilities get, and then your relaxed willingness to, to experiment becomes just part of how you do things. Yes, yeah, not really even experimentation, it's just your process. Yeah. Um, having a reputation of being one who can handle the difficult things, that's actually an amazing, wonderful reputation to have because that means you will be handed the challenges and the things that can really stretch you, stretch you as an artist. Yeah, yeah, and, 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 and once again, we're back to the, that whole notion of, of risk. You develop your skill set, and then instead of just trying to stay safely within that, you try and expand it. Yes. So, so I have a question uh, for you, Nick. Um, it's a multi-part question, so I'm going to try to ask it as succinctly as I can. Um, uh, Griffin and Sabine, and mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, you know, you've probably heard this countless times you'll have to hear it one more time the uh, impact that that series of books had on I, I i mean i don't think it's an exaggeration to say the world because there was absolutely nothing like it before and honestly nothing like it that met it after um it was something that drew so many people that i've connected with over the years into a world that they didn't even know existed not that no they publish at the time. <laughs> I, I, I can only imagine. I mean, I honestly, I mean, this is probably a whole nother conversation, you know, how that was even possible, but you seem to be a very persuasive person. So I can, I can imagine you kind of convincing, but I guess my question to you is, you know, you are so strongly connected to that. Right. And many, many people who meet you 
now in the present. Um, probably want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, and you do so much more than that. So I'm just curious, like really like at the bottom line of it, do you appreciate those conversations? Do you wish you Absolutely. were all of, you know, more strongly known for other things? Well, uh, I've, done, I've done some 30 odd books. I've, I've created, you know, four or 5,000 pieces of artwork that never appeared in books. There are many, many other things I've done. But Griffin and Sabine was, was created initially for me. You know, I, I wasn't doing it with an, a specific audience in mind. I was dealing with the, uh, an internal gestalt dialogue. And so one part of me was this tight, controlled, you know, would paint very small and execute. And there was another part of me that wanted to break out and work loose. There was a side that was very logical and mathematical. There was a, another side that was um, curious and uh, metaphysical and uh, certainly within the art, emotionally risky. And they had to find a way of coming together. So I didn't really know how to do that within my creative sphere. But once I discovered almost by accident that I could write as well as paint, that by bringing the two together so that the art would feed the text and the text would feed the art. And that then became my internal mechanism of balance. So in creating Griffin and Sabine, it was, it was a true uh, sort of, uh, internal, personal beginning of a mythological journey, which as it turned out, instead of that just being shared with a few people, first got shared with 10,000 people and then 5 million people and so on, it just kept on going. And nothing changed really in terms of what I was trying to experience. I sort of, I never, as it were, took my eye off the ball. I mean, you're referencing something you spoke about earlier, which is the kind of connecting the different, the different yeah. components and then really finding some joy and harmony when, when they meet. Yes, um, exactly. What the yeah. success did was to open doors that would never have opened otherwise because, you know, all sorts of large publishers would want to know what ideas I had next. And whereas, you know, if nothing had happened, I'd have gone to them cap in hand and been ignored. They simply said, well, yeah. And so we're back to that expression, go for it. So right. I, I, I got what I asked for. And because I think I'd probably worked for about 25 cents an hour up until that point, even though I did get reward it was still back pay right yes i love i love it looking at it that way um as was was the um as the a series continued right was that a b or both was that propelled by you needing to continue the story or was that because the publisher was excited or a combination or it came, it, Okay, so when I first had the idea for Griffin and Sabine and I put it together, um, I didn't expect that I would be the writer. I thought the, the um, publisher would find someone to write it. And when they said, um, you're, you know, you're capable of doing it, I laughed and said, you've got to be joking. Because um, when I left school, my English teacher said, the best thing you can do for humanity is never pick up a pen again. <laughs> so, so when I sure. did, <laughs> <laughs> him, Mr. Ripley. Uh, um, but there was, once it did start to happen, um, so the first Griffin and Sabine book, in my head, I hadn't completed it when I came to the end of the first book. I, I knew there was more to come, but I thought, because the original print run was 10,000, um, I thought maybe if it sold, they might let me do a second one five years down the road. Mm -hmm. But as it was, they came, you know, when they saw what was happening, they came back within a couple of months and said, you know, is there more? 
And I said, well, yeah, there's more, but you're shoving me out on the road and you're making me talk about it. How am I going to do all of that? And they said, well, just do it. So I thought, well, probably the only opportunity I get. So I did the first and then the next year I did the second and the third, but they were all there mm -hmm. waiting to tumble out. And then when it came around to doing the second trilogy in 2000, um, that was something that had been sort of came almost by accident. Someone asked me, well, Griffin and Sabine, where are they in you now, in your internal universe? And um, I said, uh, well, I don't know, I'll ask them. So I just picked up a pen and started writing and boom, it just went. Mm -hmm. it, was just, it was all there, it was like a coiled spring. So when I told the publisher, they said, great. Um, unfortunately, the book, the first book in the second trilogy was all built up and ready to go. And the day it was released was 9-11, mm -hmm. which, you know, caused a little limitation on its publicity. Um, but, you know, uh, and then the final one in the series, um, The Fair Escape, which a lot of people don't even know about. And that's the one that links the two trilogies. So really, The Ferris Gate is the fourth book in the series. And then the oh. second, it gets complicated. Just look at the pictures. Um, uh, yeah, so there, there, are, there are actually seven in all. OK. Um, a few comments, questions, I guess. Um, the one I love the best, Tracy says, you showed that, Professor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like that, best comment ever. Um, is there one event that inspired the uh, initial trilogy? Is a question. Yeah, yeah, there actually there actually is. Um, it's a story I've told a number of times, but a lot of to a people who are probably not as young as the current audience, because you know we, it goes back over thirty years. But I was um, I was living on a small island, and I went down my local post office. I had one of those little silver boxes where you get your mail. And I'd gone down to see what was in there. And usually it was just bills or you know, horrible, nasty, nasty, boring stuff. And the guy next to me who was taking the stuff out of his box, he had this really gorgeous letter. And it was a, an airmail letter with stamps on it. And I was whining that I never got anything like that. And as I got out of the post office, so I, post office, I started to walk up the road and I asked myself, well, why don't you get letters like that? The answer was because you don't send any. Mm -hmm. um, and then I started to think, what would be the perfect correspondence? With well, the perfect correspondence, it would have to have um, all sorts of, uh, it has to be mysterious. It would have to be visually beautiful. It would have to have a metaphysical level. It would have to have some kind of um, emotional stroke, um, love stroke thriller aspect to it. And I started to imagine this idea of two people writing to each other. And the first thing that came into my head was, yeah, but I'm an artist, so maybe they would send postcards to each other. But then before I got to the top of the road, I then started to think about, yeah, but what if, what if you want more than on the back of a postcard? You'd have to have a, a letter. Well, I'd already begun working you know, for, um, on an, another project for somebody else um, around pop-up books. So I knew a little bit about the, the glue techniques for pop-up books. So I realized that you could stick an envelope in a book as long as it was 24 glue points or less. So hence, that was why there were only four envelopes in the mm. first book, because you can only get 24 glue points at, at most. And it started to get more expensive the more glue points you had. Okay. Um, the um, the envelopes uh, were mechanically folded, but they had to be pre-printed. So I had to do all of the artwork in advance and know how it was going to work out. So that's that's how it sort of grew to be what it was. For those who don't know um, the books, you have a correspondence between someone who lives in London and someone who lives in the South Seas. It becomes a, a great romance. It's, um, if, as you turn the pages, you see the front of the postcard, then the back of the postcards, which are handwritten. 
and then you will come to an envelope which is physically in there and you would lift the flap and take the um, the um the letter out and unfold it and read it so it became a very tactile involving experience um i always talk about i i often um as part of my art practice make handmade books and i always talk about uh books as being the most intimate of all art for me because i believe that you know if something hanging on the wall you walk by it you can or cannot see it but if you're gonna go into a book you're touching it you're becoming part of the story you're turning the pages you're deci deciding how fast or how slow you go um and so um that brought people into your book in a way that at least for me had never been brought in before it was voyeurism with permission yeah. and it was also a cross between sex and christmas and does it get better than that <laughs> no it only took me 30 years to narrow it down to that's why it worked <laughs> <laughs> well i'm glad you did um okay so a couple questions we have a lot of questions um whose handwriting was griffin's and whose was sabine's okay so it's all mine okay. so if you go through the seven books there are actually seven different characters who handwrite so um, I'm each of them, and each one has a different pen. So think of an actor, sort of where they act into a part. So what I would do is I have um, paper for each of them. I have um, a different pen and different inks, and I created a different alphabet and handwriting style for each one. So when I would sort of sit in the chair and I would get in that position, anyone who's done any Gestalt therapy knows that um, you, you have to move from one chair to another in order to fully and properly respond. Or you have to walk down the room and turn around and come back because you're flipping between internal archetypes. Mm. So by giving them their own handwriting, their own pens, I was able to sort of far easier drop into character and move from one character to another. So it, in other words, it's voice. It's how, how do you find voice? And that was my way of finding voice. Well, that's quite, quite fascinating. Um, awesome. Inspired me to no end as a visual storyteller, pop-up books for adults. Um, I will remember reading them for the very first time. It was a delightful discovery. Wow, love them all. Um, so yeah, those, those, those kinds of comments are coming. Um, I'm going to ask Joyce just in terms of kind of the equivalent. So um, one, of, one of the themes that um, Nick has brought up is this sort of harmony between, um, uh, you know, two sides of the brain, different approaches and everything. And it, it feels to me like you, you might bring some of that to your work as well, because it's, it seems very organic to me, um, like extremely organic. And yet at the same time, as I said before, because I, it really appeals to me, it has that symmetry and that sort of order. And I'm curious if you kind of bring both, if you feel you bring both of those segments to the work that you do as well? Probably do, yes. Um, I like the, the repetitive nature, the, very, the slow process of what I do. And I think that's probably also where we really differ. I can sit and create these small little spheres or papers and sculptures for, for hours and hours. Weeks. Weeks <laughs> and months in some cases. Yeah. And, and be totally one, you know, in, in, in your space. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, should I show this? Yeah, 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 sure, yeah, of course. Of course so this yeah. is the... Uh, this, this, I think, is one of the most spectacular of all her pieces. Yeah, this is the one that was recently posted online. I, I'm going to need you to explain that. Okay, so um, this is um, the little box that you see in the middle is a Japanese typeset box. Okay. And so all those spheres inside are old letters that I have cut on the diagonal and rolled up. Um, some are around a very fine stick. And then glued them in place. Could you even hold it just a bit closer? I don't want you to hit the screen, but oh, that is just phenomenal. So that is just, that's just extraordinary. <laughs> uh, seriously, that is like, 
it's almost. Can you imagine, can you imagine um, uh, going and looking through a, a peephole into an old apothecary's uh, cabinets. Ca cabinets and and that's what you see at the end of the room. You can't quite work out what it is, but it gives you that that sort of interesting sort of combination of melancholy and magical excitement. That's what I get from looking at them. I like people to be able to look at my work and stand in front of it and try and figure out how it was created, how it was done and be intrigued by it, just to be drawn into it. And I think that a lot of my pieces have achieved that. Uh, I would definitely say that for sure. I think that I'm always um, pulled toward artwork that it seems a little mysterious. Maybe there's a word that's a little degraded and I'm pulled in to see what it is or a structure or a layer that I can't quite tell. If, if I personally, I think that the mystery and the magic is the best thing about art. I don't want somebody to look at my piece and say, oh, he put a stencil on the last layer. Mm -hmm. I want them not to be able to figure that out at all. And there's some magic, I think, you know, that crosses in so many different ways um, for both of you. There's a few comments. Um, let's see, this is just amazing. Uh, oh, wow, how fantastic. Wow, amazing. Fun to see these 3D works. Looks like pottery. Um, amazing. Wow, I've got a lot of wows. Extraordinary. Wow, <laughs> wow. Um, this is incredible. In love with capital letters with that exquisite work. I love that piece so much, Joyce. I'd love, oh, this is so unusual. I'd love to have this if I could afford it. Joyce, mission accomplished. It draws you in. I love it. Um, and then a question. Do you gravitate, Joyce, to the softness of the papers contrasting to the individual, I'm sorry, to the industrial boxes? I do. Yes. I love the softness of, as I said before, the materials are just the old papers and they are those colors. I haven't mm -hmm. altered anything. And so I just love the way they all melt together. So, but you stain, and, you, you do stain some papers. Uh, on other things, not yes. on these. These are actually right. letters that have been sliced. But sometimes I will do prints on top of tissue paper, for instance, like lino prints or jelly plates, just to get different textures. But these particular pieces are actually just the letters as they came. It was a little hard to see in the second piece, but if I saw it correctly, both the pieces you showed were there um, I know the first piece had numbers around the individual segments. The second piece seemed to also have some writing, or it was just hard to for me oh, to see at least. That's an old letter. Do you mean? Is that the one you're talking about? Oh no, I'm sorry. The um the one you just showed. Oh okay, the one. The, the two pieces that have things embedded in the little cubbies. They were numbers, I think, right? Yeah, they're bits of an old letter that I have sliced and just put down in the channels. Oh, I see. Okay. I I mean, I don't know if that's something you do in all your pieces. I love that. I, I think that's just... a little different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that is that is really wonderful. Um, a question for you. One you for, uh... old papers. How old do they have to be? Well, the older the better, but I do have some that are 1800s. So this okay. is um, a piece which is all papers that has been folded over. And then mm -hmm. you can just maybe see this a little strip of old fabric embedded in there as well. It's gorgeous. I mean, that, that just pulls you in, that focal point. Um, those yeah. pieces from Rhonda, those pieces, those paper, that paper from Rhonda is 300 years oh, old. Oh, that was yours, yeah. yeah. Oh, wow, okay. Um, so, Question for you, Joyce, um, from me. Um, do you sell your work? I do, and yeah. How, I don't yeah. have an Etsy store or anything like that, but I just sell through, we have a number of collectors that come to our studios. Okay. And so I have sold a number of pieces just from our home. Right, so so if anybody who's listening sees something on, say, on Instagram, they can just message you and ask if, if it's available, okay. Yeah, I, either by Instagram or by Facebook. Okay. And that, that applies to both of us. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Just, I mean, I'm trying to get Facebook as often, but Instagram mm. definitely. Yeah, and and I have an Etsy store, but Joyce doesn't yeah. because yeah. just because I think on a whole you feel it just doesn't show up as uh, you have well to, as it's real. It's really best to see my work. Really, it doesn't uh, show on screen. Yeah. As well. 
Um, so speaking of Etsy stores and selling art, I, I'm going to, I'm trying to really flip back and forth. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so many people may or may not know that something propelled Nick, and I'm going to ask him what, to all of a sudden, very recently, sell the original work from the books. Anybody who's freaking out, you could have just gone to his Etsy shop or gone to him directly and gotten them. And I know, based on your postings, some of the original, from the original trilogy, at least, sold extremely quickly. Could you, A, let anybody, let people know if there's anything still available, and then B, why now? I'm curious. Um, okay, so we start with the wine. Y yes, there are, there's almost nothing left of the first trilogy, just a few tiny, um, and we're talking about, oh, we're actually talking about the backs of the cards, because the artwork from the fronts of the cards, because obviously they're two different things, they were created at different times in different ways. Um, the artwork on the front varies hugely in size. Um, sometimes, uh, so for example, those who remember the samurai and the anibus, that's actually a four foot high painting in oil on canvas, whereas much of the collage and the drawings are actually not much more than postcard size. The backs of the cards is what I recently, because that stuff has been semi-available for some time just in terms of people that I meet or come here, but I haven't really pushed it or put it out there. And so some of that stuff I started to release on Etsy. But what I did was on my Facebook page, um, I let people know that I was gonna let go of the backs of the cards. Mm. And I, <laughs> I made the mistake of I made the mistake of doing it on my birthday when I thought I was just gonna <laughs> we're gonna go out for dinner and oh, you just figured maybe one or two people might yeah yeah yeah, yeah right and yeah. so that that day yeah, was yes. was just an absolute madhouse um, but anyway so most of the um, the the uh, backs of the cards and the letters have gone from the first three or the the eyes I say just a few but this second trilogy and the Pharaoh's Gate, most of that is still left because everyone dived in because they wanted a, first they wanted a slice of Griffin and Sabine, then Sabine's notebook, then the golden mean, and, and then by that time I was getting tired and they were getting tired. <laughs> <laughs> and so we just drew, drew a line under it at that point. And I, I said to Joyce the other day, probably in a few months I'll, I'll go back. But, um, if anyone is really keen, just contact me through um, through Facebook message. Or if anybody sees anything on the Etsy site, it's better just oh, to yeah. come directly to okay. us and do it that way. Yeah, I mean Etsy Etsy taking more. I, okay, this is and yeah, they're taking more and more of a, of a, a chunk, and it, it and it starts to get to a point where well, if they're going to behave that way, then our my attitude is well. I will use that as a as a storefront. Sure. So if people want to come to me, then we can do it that way. Okay. It's more so personal as well. So the so those of you who are uh, who joined uh, on the later side, um, not only can you connect with these guys on Messenger, say you know use Etsy as the catalog, and then talk to the actual artist and connect with the actual artist. But if you happen to find yourself going to Victoria in BC on Vancouver Island, feel free to contact these wonderful, amazing people who have offered to, um, you know, have you join them in their studio and um, be able to see some of the work up close and personal, which is amazing. I mean, really amazing. And really, in, work needs to be seen that way. As much as it, you know, the say a video is better than a still, a close up is better than, you know, something from afar. It's, it's nothing like seeing work um, in person. And there's another reason I think for, for trying to do things sort of more directly and personal is, you know, A, it cuts out the middleman attitude, which I think a lot of the fine art world has become, it's become sort of auction based, um, it's it's become blue chip mm -hmm. and there are sort of uh, different echelons um, within the fine art world and the higher you get up I think the more cynical it becomes mm -hmm. it, it, it becomes um, something that has very little to do with the art and spirituality that we're, we've been talking about mm -hmm. so I think it's almost 
um, down to all of us to sort of rethink that whole process of how we see art with a small a or a big a to still maintain a sense of judgment i i'm not one of those that that actually believes if you say i'm an artist and therefore if i do it it's as good as anything else that anyone has done mm -hmm. i'm more inclined to think about it in the same way as music that there are such things as bum notes and mm -hmm. just because somebody likes what they do or they you know it, that doesn't necessarily mean it taps in to an aesthetic history that goes back hundreds of years mm -hmm. so and and i know that may sound a little elitist it's not meant to be in that form it's meant to be more about of an encouragement for people to put in the hours and take the risks so what they produce they can have a growing degree of um, self-approval. Yeah, I actually don't see, I see it almost as anti-elitist. I actually see that as, as okay, very driving, 100%, um, no question about it. It's a, it's a way that I think, and you know, I live in New York City and I'm surrounded by the New York art world, which I am so not a part of. Right. Um, I, I'm not invited to be a part of. I, my successes in my world would actually be negatives in the New York art exactly. world. Exactly. Um, so you know, I found my community, and and I'm and I'm really good with that. It's 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 almost like two different. Well, it is two different worlds. Yes, really. it, yes, 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 it is. But the but I trust the the potential sophistication and honesty of the world that you're talking about more than I trust the Andy Warhol world of. Uh, let's get attention let's stick as many zeros on it as we can let's see it as an investment right no i'm with you on that and i know uh the i'm i'm sure if not all the majority of people uh, who are listening can resonate with that um as well so you have now according to christine in in her own words i think you are now um officially one of the main reasons why anyone would go to victoria i think you might rank above, <laughs> above um I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right, but Busher Gardens, I think you might rank above that. <laughs> yes. Overrated. From our <laughs> personal perspective, it tends to be a little um, busy and expensive, but there are many, many people who love Busher Gardens and yeah. um, I would not say it in any way. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I want to also mention that several people um, had said before that one one person, Christine says, I'm alternating between here and Joyce's Instagram took a close up of her gorgeous work. And she was kind enough to put the link in. And then Elaine said, I just looked at Joyce's IG and it is amazing. Would love to see in person. So, you know, you never know. You may you may get some some um people knocking at your door via messenger. Yes, you know, exactly. for sure. Um, so curious myself for you both as a couple. I had mentioned to both of you that I love interviewing mother daughter couples. I, I just find that, you know, the dynamics are so much fun and fascinating to watch. And obviously every couple's different. So I guess I'm curious about things like, even though you both work in different ways, like you find an amazing paper or, yeah. you know, you have something in your studio that you feel like, oh, that would so work. Like, how does that work? And is there any friction around things yeah. like that? Yeah. We, we should, that's yeah. the, the, the only thing that we ever sort of, I think, um, debate heavily about is uh, colors. You know, because, yeah. because, you know, everyone's eyes are different. So, <laughs> so and, and Joyce has this incredible eye for white. Yeah. She, she the, whereas I probably have maybe, 10 or 12 different whites in my mind's eye she has maybe 500 mm -hmm. and and so but when it comes to the uh, more uh, aggressive side of the the palette i which i've used I a lot more um you know we'll argue about is that vermilion or is that orange mm -hmm. 
have that discussion and, 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 rather frequently. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, okay. But, but it's it different. Yeah, it's well, we literally do. We literally, yeah. our eyes are different. And right. so we interpret it differently within our own internal spectrum. As far as materials go, we, we do share. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Generously, yeah. happily. Some rusty things, I think. Yeah, okay, okay. Colors. But we tend to find more and give them to the other person than we oh, would yeah, say, yeah. you're not having this. Right, okay. <laughs> you each feed each other, I love that. Yeah. Um, we, we have the, we have this on, ongoing joke that probably only the, if there's a, any sort of very strange um, people uh, our age um, or slightly less would know, there was um, a band uh, in the late 60s, early 70s um, called the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band. And and there was a one particular song that had a couple of characters in it called Horace Bachelor and Zebra Kid, and so um, that's our nickname. That's our nickname for <laughs> each other when we're working together. I'm Horace Bachelor, and I'm okay. and so when we're working well together, that's the character. And when when we're not, we're we're just grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I so want to say I know that song, but. <laughs> no, no, it, it's called. It, look at look it up. Bonzo Dog Doodah Band is is intro outro, and what what it is is it's a it's a um a, a, a piss take. I know it's a sidebar, but it's a it's a piss take in the way jazz people would use to introduce the various people playing the instruments. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Except, so the uh, first one starts up, and then the second one, and then they keep on going. So you get layer after layer of of pure cacophony. <laughs> it's, it's very Spike Jonesy. <laughs> I love that. It's 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 the chaos. Um, so somebody says, um, "I'm an urban space man." Bonzo dog go to bed. Got it. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> now um, he's European, so I'm just going to say, were they were they a UK based band? Yeah, they they, they were. And if, if you if ever you remember, there was a, um, a, a Michael o, Mike Oldfield who did Jubilee mm -hmm. Bells. Yep. Okay, well, Michael Field's first manager was um, Virgin, Virgin uh, Bran oh, Branson? Branson, Branson, Richard, Richard okay. Branson. Um, but on Tubular Bells, the guy who says the bells is actually Viv Stanchel, who was the lead in Bonzo. There you go. It just okay. some obscure <laughs> connection. Everybody's connected. No, no, no. I, 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 I use that as an example. I'm not being totally stupid because the tangents that you go off in are really important. And I mentioned earlier um, someone like Rauschenberg, who he allowed himself tangents to see where they would go. Mm. And I think the more we allow that within our art, within our, our lives, we don't keep disappearing for a million miles up them, but we allow ourselves to take the little sidebars. That's when we discover connections yeah. and things that start to um, lead to other things. If I hadn't been sitting in a cafe looking at a book on Egyptology and then looked up and seen um, a Wurlitzer jukebox, I would never have made the Egyptian jukebox, mm. the book. It, it, it's about being open to possibilities and connections. Yeah, that, that um, the analogy I think about is when I travel, um, it, instead of going the path that I know, always going left or right instead of the yeah. opposite and exploring and discovering and almost always finding something that made it worthwhile. Yeah. And even when you don't, it's still worthwhile because most of the time you do, and that's, mm -hmm really true with art exploration too. It doesn't always work, but allowing yourself those sidebars, yeah. that means that most of the time you're gonna find something that you never even knew. Was it may in. take 10 years for it to make sense. Yes, but Once it will. Hit that point where it does, you look back and you go, well, of course. Yes, exactly. Um, uh, uh, Kirsty says, I'm laughing now because this is a bit like conversations with my husband. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody linked, um, I guess to um, intro out to on YouTube right. so that people can go see. Oh, good. Good, good, good. <laughs> we have yay for tangents. I say embrace the happenstance. People are totally um, um, grooving with this. Uh, so also 
basic question, uh, maybe not the right description. How long have you both been uh, married? Well, married is one thing. We've been together for 20 years. 22. Okay. I guess I was in the 28. <laughs> uh -oh. Uh -oh. Harsh. Harsh. <laughs> and married for we've been quite um, a while. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We we, joke, we we were both um previously married, so we were well prepared to how actually yeah. to we um support and love each other as right. we both to struggle. We waited 10 years until we got married. Just right, okay. Well, it, it works on you both for sure. And we've got six kids between us, so it's pretty amazing we're still here because we're, <laughs> <laughs> we're emotionally knackered. <laughs> five was a girl, so there's lots of drama. Oh, five girls? Yeah, yes. yeah. You get, okay. sometimes drama in a good way, sometimes just sheer exhaustion. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure even those uh, people who, um, you know, maybe geographically challenged and don't know what knackered means know it just by the context of what you just shared. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we won't go into dead horses and glue. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's, yeah, that was the one thing we said we weren't gonna talk about. <laughs> now, just to be fair, I know that Nick, you, I asked you both to kind of bring a little bit of your work or something. So I know you have a few things piled up there. Maybe you can show us whatever you like. Um, okay. As well, I, uh, very very quick. Um, start with the most. Um, yeah, the art. Okay, the originals. Okay, because <laughs> you haven't seen any any of my. Well, you've seen the the painting at the back. But yeah. This the other end of the scale. This is from uh, um, Sabine. It's an oil painting of a kangaroo in a red hat. Um, I want to turn it sideways, but that isn't going to work because um, I'm only seeing a little bit of this. Um, uh, as I say, it's an, oil, it's an oil painting. You get a sense of the scale. Um, the coat that he's wearing um, was Ringo Starr's coat. I don't own it, but I borrowed it visually. And the hat, the red hat, comes from a portrait in the National Portrait Gallery. Um, the other bits, well, you know, you never know where things come from. Um, <laughs> Uh, what else have we got? Okay, um, not so much a physical thing, but um, the last thing that I had come out was this. Um, and it is called the Archaea. And I've been fascinated by archetypes um, for a long, long time. I use them in my uh, workshops, which I don't do anymore, um, teaching, uh, writing and art. And I started to realize over a period of time that we have multiple characters within ourselves. It's not just, as I said, with Griffin's being two people. That was just the beginning of the dialogue. The more I delved into it, the more I found, you know, I'm made up from goodness knows how many parts. So as I started to work on the Jungian notion of archetypes, I started to consider the idea that we can actually grow our archetypes. Um, mm and actually have them develop in a, a way that supports and helps us when we most need. So I created um, a card deck of 40 cards. This is the company is Llewellyn. They're one of the biggest um, tarot card makers in the world. These are not about fortune telling, but these are tools to actually help people um, Mm. I hate that word get in touch with, but but to actually uh, become comfortable with the various parts of themselves so that they can actually utilize them. And there's a book that goes 180 page book that goes that's actually you find in the box and that describes everything I'm saying in detail that makes far more sense than I just dribbled. Well, you, you probably don't have to explain it too much because comments, I love the cards. I use them in my studio every day when I do my quiet time before I start my artwork. I have these cards. Um, love, I'm looking forward to the new one. Does that mean? Yes, I am. I'm working. I, I'm surprised anyone knows. I'm working on a new deck. Um, okay. I can't say anything about it, but I just signed the contract with Llewellyn. Um, and 
yeah um yeah i i'll I hold my powder on that one but it's it's, it's coming um just you be, be patient another year or so you know nick i asked i asked you guys for a scoop and i just got my scoop <laughs> i am good i am good well, well whilst i complete this i've also just agreed to um uh with a small publisher um not yet to, ready to fully release information yet but my hundred word stories which is something i'm very fond of um uh, hundred word stories are called travels and but these are not approximately 100 words these these stories are each exactly 100 words long <laughs> so again in the down the road these will definitely be coming out in book form well it's definitely something to look forward to and again a scoop um i will tell you that i don't know i i i, I assume you get royalties on sales i hope anyway um, well, old stuff it's the old, old stuff is long 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 gone you have to keep on working just to sort of oh. keep things ticking over i know isn't that awful um but those those cards you just showed oh yeah yeah because lots of people said they're off to buy them now good oh. good 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 that, that's that's good <laughs> <laughs> um and somebody said um who sells this? Who, who sells? Um, well, um, ours in Victoria, there's a um, there's a, a place called the Papery. Great place. Live in Victoria. Go to the Papery. They've got them. Um, but most oh, most bookstores, them. metaphysical bookstores, you can yeah. also buy them online. Um, yeah, there's a, you just start poking around and you'll okay. find. But first of all, I would always encourage people to go to an independent bookstore and mm. ask because we want to keep the independent bookstores going and thriving uh with 100 percent and very often even if they don't carry it they'll be more than happy to order it oh yeah them. yeah and they can yeah. get it really quickly i mean yeah. it's it's a Llewellyn is a is a world-based company uh they're set in the united states so they you know if you order it you're going to get it within a few days yeah fantastic um yeah people know and can't wait for your 100 word as well so um we are going to wind down in, in just a few minutes so um before i say thank you i just want to see if there's anything that either of you would like to share or um if there's any maybe you can even one more time because not everybody was here in the beginning let everybody know the best place to find you um online or or anything you want to share in the last few minutes i think i've covered Okay, Joy, 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 Joy's exhausted. She's she's not <laughs> used to this. You, you can see I, I'm just like a young puppy who keeps on bouncing up and wanting, <laughs> wanting to play. It was, after it's over, then I collapse and her energy rises. <laughs> the two of you, I have to say, are adorable together. I mean, I oh, I'm a former psychologist. I know I told you guys that. So you know, I don't know if I just see couples dynamics maybe differently, but you know, for me. There's an individual, there's another individual. And when you put the two individuals together as a couple, you get a completely different third entity. Mm -hmm. And you know, you are just the two people that I would love. I, I wish I lived closer. I would love, I don't know, to go to the pub with you. Um, uh, I completely agree. I feel yeah. I feel the you the same about you. And so to anyone else Hopefully listening, that will be <laughs> that, that we may be able to fix that at some point. And we have a yes, good we might now for new too. Oh, oh, I love that. Okay, so one, one, one sort of seemingly weird question, and for Nick, and I don't know if I'm getting the name right. Um, in the UK, mm -hmm. uh, weekend nights is it in the pubs? Is it quiz night? Yeah, they would be they, actually. You know, there's a few pubs here in um, um, in Victoria that have quiz nights. They do. So there's I have to question, imagine trivia questions. I have to imagine that you would be able to answer, like, I would definitely want you at my table. Well, th th thank you, thank you. I, I, I would say probably uh, I'm, I'm, I'm good for, for, for sport, art, movies. and movies. Yeah, that's, that's probably my speciality. Okay. I hate to say when I was there with some friends um, and the few US-based questions came up, I, I failed them all. <laughs> <laughs> not, not my best night um people have said um amazing and thought-provoking artists thank you we're all in the pub with you guys right now 
Right, so, right. Love. love that Nick and Joyce are British and both and love both of your art and books. Um, this is what makes this the great conversation. The report is so fun. Quiz night Thursday. We'll see you there. <laughs> um, this is wonderful. Um, I'm so happy to be aware of Joyce and her beautiful work and trivia Nick. <laughs> um, so I want to, uh, first of all, thank everybody who, who joined live. And it's so great to be in these conversations live because you can really ask questions and interact. And I don't know, it's, it's sometimes the best that we have given the distance between all of us. And it's, it's just very special to be able to do this in real time. I do know there's going to be a lot of people who are watching on recording, and I appreciate if you're listening at this point, that means you stayed through the whole thing, which is <laughs> quite impressive because this was 90 minutes. Um, I will have to have a repeat performance. I'm, I'm definitely going to do a best of at some point, and I'm going to absolutely invite you both back. Um, yeah, I'd love to, and, and you know, you can throw as many curveball questions as you like, because that's, that's part of the fun is like, if we don't know what we're going to say, it's it's so much better than those sort of prepared answers. Yeah, I I I, I so agree, a hundred percent.